The food movement needs money. <laughs> All right. You probably just heard the shortest TED talk. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so two weeks ago, I took my boy, and he was very excited. We went on uh, one of those uh, night at the museum. It was uh, organized by the, uh, um, the Boy Scout he's part of. So it's about almost 100 boys and, uh, and uh, their parents. So we're told uh, not to bring food. So uh, of course, we understand it's a museum after all. But there's a dinner and there's a breakfast uh, after the night of the museum. We end up soon after check-in uh, in this what's supposedly called the dining hall with folded tables and chairs. And the food choices were amazing. Nine gigantic vending machines. So as, as a uh, exile from China and uh, as uh, a concerned father who paid attention to food for years, I know better, so I smuggled food in. It was a um, <laughs> little awkward. It was almost surreal that we had to find a quiet corner and, you know, and, and we ate our food you know, in secrecy. And, and this is not an isolated instance, as you saw in that powerful film, right? Uh, in that poem that uh, as a father of three young children uh, in New York City, that I was excited when they got into the public school system, the given talent system, and one of the things I felt uh, that we, 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 I was really hoping for them to do is to share the school lunch, share a meal with uh, their classmates, because that's one of the most important, probably the most important moment in my family when we share a meal at dinner. So fast forward, you know, and we still pack lunch, just like when they were in private school because uh, you eat healthy, they eat well at home, and you can't do that. And so that's, that's made me realize, not only, this is a constant reminder, not only the school lunch is bad, the entire food system is in, really in a state of crisis. And, uh, and our solution, as simple as it is, also made me realize that food is not a problem food only. Food is a problem of poverty. Food is a problem of failed market mechanism. Food is in a state where we all agree, not just people in this room, you know, we're, you know, we're the fashionable people, you know, food is the new black, and we're almost in the center of the known food universe. That's Brooklyn, right? Next, next borough. But, you know, food is in a state where policy we can all agree, everybody can agree, is not in place because of bad politics. So food is a problem of money in politics, right? And we saw that food is an epidemic for our future, our younger generation, and it's a global epidemic because as soon as any other country that's barely moving out of poverty, they quickly move toward this very peculiar version of Western diet, which is highly processed animal fat and protein-centric diet. So I, I went on this journey as I, I look into deeper and deeper in this, uh, in this uh, food crisis. Um, and I also see it's an opportunity because if food ties so many things together that need drastic, big step solutions, changing food will change all of that, right? So the social activist, the concerned father uh, in me, wanted to do good. And uh, as I look deeper, it's nothing short of a moment of epiphany that uh, I realize that contrary to my impression, I bet a lot of people's impression that industrial agriculture and food system is actually not efficient. You know, I, we, I would have thought, okay, it may not be tasty, it may not be even healthy, but at least it's e efficient. It may not preserve culture, and uh, you know, it pr probably produce more calorie, right? So that's a three quarter, roughly, of the global population are fed by independent family farmers, basically farming practices that's actually leverage the resilience of nature, working with nature, and that, Three quarter of the population is fed by a quarter, roughly, of the global resource. Do the math, right? The reverse is true for the industrial agriculture. Right? 16 times of efficiency in more natural focused, nature focused agriculture. So now, the, the, the entrepreneur and the investor in me start to think, wait a minute, not only I can do good, but I can do good and then doing well. I mean, I sound like a perfect millennial, but this happened to be true. We're really at that point where a perfect storm may just happen that not only we can do well by doing good, by changing the food system, 
But I would make the argument, and I hope some of you, uh, maybe the sponsors of the event, will follow our act, that those who really focus on the best solutions in terms of uh, impact in, on people and on the planet, the social, ecological impact, will, uh, and at large scale, will actually be those new business innovations that's most profitable. And we'll check this uh, in the next fo fo following years. Because is that, that's really the moment of epiphany, that as I was looking at all these problems and getting excited of being able to work on a big challenge, I see many of you already pointed out concrete steps, and this is not a moment of just describing problems, also celebration of solutions. I really feel there's an emerging movement of various kinds that is really converging. The, the electoral system that uh, Chef Calicchio talked about, the, uh, the congressional office and, uh, and the protests and the soda tests and all that. So this are the, basically, these are nutrients feeding this food movement. But more than anything else is a cultural change. And I, uh, uh, thanks to many of you before me, I, say, I actually guide my uh, journey in here that the, uh, these are fantastic storytellers, investigative journalists, uh, uh, visionaries, and celebrity chefs, and farmers that really provide this wealth of uh, not just discovery, but recognition or, or re realization of a simple time-tested fact that uh, there is a better way we nurture our body and our community and preserve nature and, 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 the, and the environment. So people really start, because of this, they're, they're really moving the needle in terms of uh, shoppers and conscious shoppers and eaters, start to really ask the question, where did my food come from? What's in my food? Let's show a video of, uh, actually I think this is from the uh, uh, movie uh, uh, Anchorman. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Betty, is, is this chicken? Hell no. It's really impossible to turn a profit if you serve real chicken. Yeah, we use mainly bats. What? Yeah, but the, the good quality kind. I mean, I, you know, look, being one of the probably three only Chinese in the audience and, and, and being a Chinese immigrant uh, in New York City, you know, I have to address the obvious irony here. You know, we're, we're known to do things like this off the chart. But. <laughs> You know, actually, you know, uh, we have the chicken of the rice paddy, right? I mean, so that means, for those of you uh, who are really sophisticated, that means frog in the dish. And, uh, uh, and, and so, so, but it's one thing to be creative, uh, to capture cultural nuances about parts of the animal and the, 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 the sauces, the presentation of a dish is quite another to have more than 90% of our food choices being made in a way that is highly processed at an industrial scale, and we don't even know what's in there, right? So this is also an opportunity, like all the other problems we talked about, right? So somebody earlier today brilliantly said, eating is a moral act. And I will further iterate, eating is a political act. Each time we buy, we cook, we offer food, that's a vote. That is a direct, democracy vote. So you see, in all the, all the radical movement back in China, where more, more recently in Occupy Wall Street participated, we have to deal with either a police state or representative democracy that you have to still go through a political system. You, you know, the protest does not, it's not an end in itself, right? But the voting in our food choices is direct, right? So as we all know, a functional democracy does not depend only on the right to vote. It's equally dependent on the contestation of viable alternatives. That's where I see this huge opportunity. This opportunity, not only for profit, but also for people, the social impact, and for the planet, the environmental impact. The opportunity is to restore the efficiency that's mostly naturally there. Right? I, I give you the, 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 the agricultural example. Some, another example closer to home, oranges. Right, or most of the fruit, right? It takes three up to eight oranges today to provide the same amount of nutrients that the orange will provide half a century ago. So we're not talking about 60% efficiency, 100% efficiency. We're talking about many magnitude of efficiencies. And so we don't, and we don't need a magic uh, bullet or, or new dis scientific discovery to do that. We have this, this wealth of a of system that's tested even before mankind existed. It's called 
nature. Yeah. <laughs> so my fund, I have a quarter, million, a quarter billion dollar, uh, 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 I wouldn't say under management because it's our own money. This is what I meant, that food movement needs money. That is not just any amount of money because when I look at food investment, there's a lot of food enthusiasts, individually affluent uh, 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 NGO investors funding the new ideas, right? And then you have a very late stage, big fund investment, right? But it's almost a desert in between. So that's why the little guys who are really hungry for real big changes. These are the eaters, the shoppers, the innovators, the entrepreneurs. They're starved, they're choked in terms of really providing that compelling commercial alternatives to the current food system. And that's what we want to enable. That's what we want to empower. And that means it has to be patient capital. So our time frame is 12 years. That's, for those of you who know, that's almost twice as long, or twice as long, at least, to the normal fund. And it's a triple bottom line focus. That because we believe by, by really focusing on the big picture and doing good, that's actually the most disruptive. And, and that's based on the fact that green is actually efficient. Healthy is actually efficient. You know? So we're not full tech per se. We're not just introducing digital efficiency into a traditional uh, industry or market. We're not food science either. You know, those you may or may not know what's considered the cutting edge of food science. Let's, let's uh, show another clip. Let's see what Michael Moss find out. Yeah, yeah. You know, Snickers bars. And you, <laughs> and you gotta love the language that these guys come. One of my favorite terms is vanishing caloric density. <laughs> That's the Cheeto which scientists in the food industry consider the height of food engineering. It, I don't know if you noticed, but it melts in your mouth. Oh, I've noticed. When it, <laughs> and when it does that, it sends a signal to the brain, which basically says, John, Michael, keep eating, because the calories have vanished. Vanishing caloric density. That's, a, that's, a, that's one of my favorites. See, I didn't know that was vanishing caloric density. I just thought it was my friend. <laughs> Our brain does not need to be tricked when it comes to food. Real food is naturally satisfying, and our brain knows that. So, nature is actually our friend. That's the real friend here. And so, so this is one movement that I, I joined and made a long-term commitment that I can have a smile on my face. And you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, for any of you who've participated in a radical movement, and people are angry, you know, there's a real rage. But I'm saying so not because food put real good food, put a smile on your face. It's not because, have you noticed that uh, food movement activists are a happier bunch? You, you guys are a happier bunch. <laughs> than, you know, and, and, and because food rarely divides, it is food unite, you know, good food unite, right? But it's not just because of that, it's because this is a movement as profound, as potentially impactful as it is, I can actually see the finish line. And mark my words, and I've gone through some tough shit, <laughs> not tough problems, but the, uh, <laughs> pardon my Chinese. The, uh, uh, <laughs> that was the chicken of the cave. The, uh, uh, I can actually see the finish line because it, my, my journey ended with this long-term commitment, multi-stage, uh, uh, multiple stage investment, really hand-holding of uh, real innovators to go through to really create an alternative and joining forces with policy changes, elect electoral system changes, protests, cultural changes, so that together, together, we can regain that respect of nature that gave birth to mankind, right? And together, we're going to do good and doing very well. And you know what? This time, while we're doing good, the good deed is not the reward in itself. It's better. And I'm not talking about profit because when nature is recognized and respected and the resilience is restored and we leverage that resilience, it will reward us handsomely and make this a delicious movement. Thank you.